Hi, I'm Eileen Rhodes, founder of Designs and Machine Embroidery, and welcome to Between Friends. Today's episode is all about the weightless quilter. I know many of you have already purchased it or you're thinking about this solution for quilting with your embroidery machine because the weightless quilter really does handle the bulk. But before we get started, take a look at my tree. How cute is that? It's our exquisite spools of thread and bobbins decorate the tree. I wish I could tell you that that was my idea, but truth be told, yesterday, um, let me switch over to PowerPoint, I had uh, a visit, a virtual visit with my friend Reen Wilcoxon, and she had a, a tree with our spools of thread and our bobbins. And I just thought, oh my goodness, that's absolutely adorable. Reen's so fun, isn't she? And, you know, well, I had a tree and I most certainly have tons of spools of thread. So up it went. So thank you, Reen, for that. We really appreciate, um, you know, that idea. Super fun. And, you know, Reen uses exquisite thread every day. If you purchase her embroidery collections, that's the thread that she uses. So if you want your embroidery to look like Reen's, that's the thread. Okay, so today is all about the weightless quilter. And we're going to talk about uh, a number of things. We're going to, you know, first off, what's in the box, right? And what's in the box. So we'll review that. Sorry. And then we're going to customize those poles. Now you don't have to customize the poles, but if you already have the weightless quilter or you're embarking on purchasing it, you know, this is good information for you. You may decide that you would like to customize those poles. And I'm going to show you how to do it. It's really simple. Then we'll prepare the quilt sandwich. After that, we'll set up the weightless quilter and we'll actually take a look at different scenarios, whether you have a um, small sewing table, a large sewing table, furniture, a multi-needle machine. We'll look at all of those arrangements. And then we'll break down the quilting into zones because, you know, we're working in a hoop, right? And our quilt could be anything from six, 36 inches square all the way to a king size quilt. So we're gonna to have to break that down into zones or what I call quadrants. And then finally, we'll head over to the weightless quilter and see it in action. And I'll give you uh, some tips on maybe some troubles that you have experienced and how to solve them. So this is basically what it looks like underneath your table, right? It just sits, it's a floor frame and it sits underneath your table and it has flexible poles that extend around the table and they are ready to receive the quilt. Here, here we have um, a quilt set up. The image on the right shows quilting in the lower right corner of the quilt. So the quilt is extended all the way behind the table and that's the poles that flex back. We have not actually moved that frame. It's just that the poles flex back and allow, you know, the quilt to move with the hoop as it moves. And on the image on the left, and now I'm working kind of in the right center area of the quilt or the upper right quadrant. And you'll notice that they have a clip on that lower right corner because there's not that much fabric extend extending beyond the table but I most certainly do have the other three corners of the quilt secured in the weightless quilter. So on a uh, an embroidery machine that's sitting on a small sewing machine table, I would put that floor frame around the table. I only use two of the four floor bars that come with it. And that's because um, I've just learned from experience, I don't need all four floor bars. So I think I was supposed to show what's in the box, wasn't I, Sam? I'm supposed to do that. I missed my, my uh, cue there. So let's go ahead over to the overhead cam so you get a better understanding of what I'm talking about. Here are the co floor corner brackets. So these you will receive four of these in the box. And they have two holes to receive the narrow diameter pole and the wider diameter pole. They also have a, a tunnel here, like a T on both sides, and that's to create a corner. So your floor bar 
is inserted into that side and also into this side. And so that's how you get a corner. That's the, sorry. That's how you get uh, a corner of the weightless quilter on the floor. You will also apply the um, tape that comes, the felt pads that come with in the box. And then once that's applied to the pole, you'll notice that it sits really nice and tight inside those holes in the corner bracket. On the other end, and of course I have a miniaturized version here, you'll have your fabric clamp and that also has two different size holes. So you'll use the appropriate one for the pole that you're using. The fabric clamp has a, a large opening for your fingers and I just grasp it in, in this fashion and I operate it with the inside palm of my hand. And I've also applied the finger cots that come with it over those clamps so that they protect my fabric from you know the orange grip pieces that are at the end of the clamp. And so you'll get eight of those in your box, four fabric clamps in the box. You're going to receive four large diameter poles and four narrow diameter poles along with the four floor bars and the four corner brackets. So I'm gonna move this aside and I'm gonna show you how to cut those, um, how to cut a pole. And it's really, I, I literally use this very inexpensive steak knife, you know, from a big box store. They come like eight to a box and they're not even $12, I don't think. They're really inexpensive. And you know, you just wanna maybe clamp it down and then you just saw, and it, when it's clamped down, it's a lot easier to do. And you're going to, you know, take a little bit of time to cut this, but it will eventually cut all the way through. You could use a hacksaw, but you don't need a power tool or anything like that. Literally an inexpensive steak knife works. So that's how you do that. And super easy. So what's up next, Sam? Are we gonna do the, um, the batting? I think so. So our next thing I want to talk to you about is how to make your quilt sandwich, because that would be your next important task. So I like to use pool noodles for that. And here I have my quilt backing fabric applied to the pool noodle wrong side up. And so when I apply it to my pool noodle, I pin it right to the pool noodle. Make sure it's in a straight line on that noodle and then smooth the fabric and of course you'd press your fabric mine's a little wrinkly and i just roll it all the way on the pool noodle now you know this is a really small quilt right but at home this morning i worked on a quilt that i'll show you in a little bit that is 62 inches wide so i actually needed two of these pool noodles taped together end to end to get a nice long piece because I think pool noodles are about four feet. So once that is done, that's your backing, then you're going to place the quilt top on the uh, pool noodle, on a second pool noodle, same diameter. Again, you'll make a straight line with the edge and then you'll roll that. And I think I actually have these on here backwards, we'll see. Okay, so now it's time to apply yeah, I do. I have this one backwards. Oh my. Oh, well, you'll forgive me, won't you? So I should have rolled this on so that it is wrong side up. Wrong side up. Best laid plans, right, folks? And let's see, Diana Mulligan's, uh, um, Mullins Atkinson, you say, uh, love the pool, pool noodle technique. Yeah, it is a great technique. Make sure you do it right. So you want your backing fabric wrong side up, just like it would be, you know, in your quilt sandwich. And then we roll that up. Okay, so now that I have that done correctly, we're gonna roll that back out and take uh, your batting and place it with the edge, the lower edge lined up and let me move that up so you can see that lower edge so you want to make sure that that's aligned my backing is larger than my batting uh, and normally my batting is the same size and then we take our quilt top again we line up those edges 
And I do suggest when you are quilting with an embroidery machine that you make your, uh, you have some excess fabric on your quilt top. So you have maybe some extra border, you leave a couple extra inches all the way around. And then you're just going to pin. And I like to use this size safety pin. It's about one and a half inches. And I just pin about five inches apart, about a hand's width apart. I have some of these little guys in there and I don't really need them. I like this curved brass safety pin. And so we'll, you know, do this one section and we could probably benefit from one more uh, pin right here. And then I use a tool called Quick Clip. This is available in every uh, big box sewing store. And that's what I use to close those safety pins because you're going to be doing, you know, a lot of those safety pins. And then we just pull this excess, the area that's already been basted with the safety pins towards you. And then again, we repeat that process. So we would get more of those noodles out there. I'm not, not noodles, more of the pins, the safety pins and apply them. And then I'm ready to go to the machine. And when we do that, you'll see that's how I've done it on the large sample over there. So I love that pool noodle technique. I know there are other methods where people use, um, you know, pieces of wood instead of the pool noodle. But what I like about the pool noodle is I can pin right into it and uh, it makes it, you know, nice and secure for sure. Okay, so let's head back over. Uh, oh, then Joanne Banco, she uses pool noodles to roll and store fine fabrics like silk dupioni. Very nice. Well, I use pool noodles to store quilts also because they don't have any folds or creases in them, which is very nice. And um, it makes it easy to transport. Sometimes I have to take a lot of stuff back and forth from home to, um, you know, the office. And Candy Bray, you put a wooden dowel in the hole. That's a great idea. I put the weightless quilter poles in the hole and, and that keeps keeps it nice and rigid and straight because, you know, they do want to kind of bend, right? Mm -hmm. That's what they do, those pool noodles. Yeah, and uh, I know, uh, Victoria, I love that noodle idea. I showed it on Sewing with Nancy many years ago, I think in 2017, and oh, I love it. Nancy loved it. She thought that was really great. Okay, so let's go back to PowerPoint and take a look at how it would be set up with a small machine. And that's where it surrounds the table. You're going to put that floor frame outside of your table. Now, what you want to remember is that the weightless quilter is really framing your pantograph. And your pantograph is the embroidery arm. That's what moves your hoop. And it's also going to be moving your quilt. So don't think of the weightless quilter as holding a queen size quilt, all four corners sprayed, you know, splayed out around your machine. You're just working on a zone, right? You're just going to work on a zone. I have more um, images to show you that could help for sure. So let's see, in a small spaces like here, I only have the two floor bars down. You can see the one on the left and the one in, on, you know, uh, parallel to the machine on the floor. And I'm in the upper right corner of the quilt at this time. And I have both uh, of the front corners of the, the lower area of the quilt you know, held in one fabric clamp. I don't need to have all those clamps. I just have the one holding it in place. Okay, on a larger table, now I would just put that floor bar underneath the table because again, I want to get close to the pantograph. It's not really about the table. It's about the hoop. And as you know, your machine doesn't move on the table, right? The hoop's going to move a limited amount, but not the machine. So you are really f framing that pantograph. Okay. On a sit down free motion, which many people use the weightless quilter for free motion quilting, you have uh, a couple options depending on the size of your quilt. So on the image on the left, that would be for a um, smaller quilt and you would have the three floor bars and you would um, position the bars surrounding the machine so that it can hold up the back of the quilt. Now remember your quilt as shown on the right side is gonna, you know, it has to kind of curve into that head of the machine, right? And so if you need more width, so now you could use all four floor bars 
but the two behind the machine aren't connected. They're just, you know, laying on the floor and kind of facing each other. And, and that will hold up those corners on the outside very well. Okay, so let's see. Here's uh, Joni Zyra Pool, an award-winning quilter, sitting down at the weightless quilter. And she's working on one area of the quilt. So she has all the quilt extended off to one side. She's not in the center of the quilt and trying to work with the quilt around the machine. She just has it off to one side, that excess area. Now, the weightless quilter even works on multi-needle machines, which is awesome because I know many of you want to quilt with your multi-needle machine. So again, you're going to use the four floor bars, but probably not connect them in the back. And the reason why you don't connect them is because if you do connect them, that's a six foot length that, you know, the quilt would have to be um, large enough to fit in those four corners. And you'll see when we get over to the machine running, you'll notice that um, not all of the quilt, not all four corners have to be grasped in the fabric clamps. It's a process for sure. You'll move from one quadrant to the other. So here's a quilt and it, you see one, two, three, and four. I usually start right in the, in where, in the vortex, let's say, in the true center of the quilt. So my first hooping is probably in area one, two, you know, right where that horizontal seam meets. And then um, I am grasping the quilt in this area of the quilt. So those white dots um, symbolize the fabric clamps and they're just holding a portion of the quilt. They're not necessarily all the way out at the edge of a quilt. Now that would you know depend on the size of your quilt. So on a quilt that's, um, let's see, maybe 50 inches wide, you would possibly have the two outside corners in the back of the machine clamped in a hoop. If you, the width of your quilt is large, is wider than 50 inches, then you're going to have just a portion of the quilt clamped in those fabric clamps. Okay, then we're going to advance, right? We're going to move from one territory, one zone uh, to another as we hoop and we advance the quilt. Uh, we just continue to stay on the right half of the quilt, quadrants one and two. And, you know, lower left is probably my, my, the last row that I do. It's kind of like, I know I'm ha almost halfway through, right? That last one. Of course, I'm just showing you a couple hoopings, but you know, on the hoop, on the, on the quilt that I'm going to show you over on the weightless quilter, it is 62 inches wide by 80 inches long. So I'm gonna have a lot more than four hoopings in a quadrant, right? Um, total hoopings will probably be about 55. So, um, but I don't worry about that. I don't, because I know that weightless quilter and monster hoop is gonna make it super easy, super easy. Yeah. Okay, so Theo, you can call customer service and we can help you out with that, okay? Um, you can go to our website, DZGNS, and uh, the phone number is there and they'll, they'll help you with that. So then we're going to advance the quilt and then reposition uh, the fabric in the weightless quilter. So let's see, you'll finish that top right quadrant and then you're gonna flip the quilt completely. So now you'll see that my quilt is upside down and I'm going to rotate my design 180 degrees and then I'm gonna work the quilt the same way because the quilted portion one and two is now extending away from the machine and the unquilted portion is under the needle. So let's go ahead and take a look over at the machine. I have um, my really fun Christmas quilt that I'm about to get finished and this is gonna be available a project for you next year. And we'll do Christmas in July and this project will be ready. But I just want you to see how the weightless quilter is moving. So I'm in the first quadrant, kind of in the center of the quilt. And I have the weightless quilter is holding the quilt about 12 inches from the edge here, and even, you know, further away from the other edge, about 12 inches on that side. 
So I don't have all four corners held in place. I just have my zone, the portion of the quilt that I'm working on currently. In the foreground, again, I have both edges, both corners of the quilt grasped in the fabric clamp. And that makes, um, just makes it accessible for me to get in here. I would have a, a, a chair here and I would be sitting here and actually working at the machine. So that's why I don't like to have my fourth pole. I wanna get in there, I'm gonna have to re-hoop, right? So, and advance the quilt. And of course you can see I have my uh, jumbo snap hoop monster in place. Now I want you to take a look at a video that shows you what's happening on the side of the quilt. And that's something that I can see from my position right here. And we're gonna bring... drained. It's really very nice. I'm cleaning up my mess here. Okay, let me see what kind of questions we have. Okay, I'm going to take a let's see, Sharon Dalton, you have a question um, here. What size is the monster hoop you are using? And what size is good to well, I would suggest you purchase the largest hoop available for your machine because um, when you're quilting, you know, it's going to be a lot of hooping. So the quicker you can process that, you know, the, the happier you'll be probably. So I'm on a Baby Lock Solaris and that's our 10 by 16. That's the biggest hoop that we make for Baby Lock and Brother. And that is compatible with the... Um, the baby lock Solaris and the brother luminaire. So uh, of course, you know, it's your choice, what size you get. And if you have a machine that takes maybe an eight by 12 or a nine and a half by 14, they're great hoops. They're fabulous hoops. In fact, I've often used the nine and a half by 14 more than I do the 10 by 16. Now, when you select your embroidery design, do not make the size, the exact size of your hoop because you're going to want a little wiggle room. You know, you're going to be hooping over and over and over again. So you're going to want some wiggle room so that you can move the design uh, to achieve perfect placement. And, you know, that's important for sure. That's important. Oh, let's see, Retha, you're making um, freestanding lace angels right now for tuck-in gifts. What's a tuck-in gift? Tell me what that is. That sounds really sweet. Um, yeah, and you know, you can use monster hoop for any kind of embroidery, lace or um, even most certainly quilting, but I love it for t-shirts and knits. Okay, so let's take a look at um, the PowerPoint. I have an image here of a customer who um, was struggling with her weightless quilter. So you can see the floor bar that she has in the foreground is lifting off of the floor. And that's because the fabric pole is too short. So this would be a good example of when you should trim your poles. Now I can tell you that the weightless quilter poles are really too long for most, most sewing rooms. The reason why we have them at that length is because some people sew at a counter height and you know, it's just easier to have people cut down poles than to ship long poles to those who need them. And everybody, you know, everybody's setup is a little bit different. So I find that if the pole is about 14 inches taller than my table height, that's a good size for the back poles. In the foreground, I like a much shorter pole. Mm, the one I have there I, over there, I think is only about 36 inches tall. So, and that's just going to keep the quilt level with the machine bed. So um, she could also reposition the clamp. Like right now, she what you see extending down off the um, right-hand side of the fabric clamp is the corner of the quilt. 
And so she should relax that fabric a little bit. But if the poles are long, that's going to lift that floor bar. Like, you can't see my floor bars, but they're not moving at all. Not at all. So let's see, Donna, you want to know what size design would you choose for nine and a half by 14? I'd probably go with like three and uh, eight and three quarter inches by maybe 13. I'd like to leave, you know, three quarters of an inch, maybe an inch in each dimension. And that just gives me a little flexibility in the hoop so that I can move for sure. Uh, oh, a tuck in gift is you tuck it in with another gift. Adorable. Duh. Right. Sorry, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's take a look at another situation. So here you can see that fabric, that uh, floor clamp is lifting, and that's because that pole is too tall, most likely, or, well, it's too tall, but also maybe she doesn't need that thick diameter pole. And I can see from this image, what she's using is the thick diameter. The thinner one, it gives more flexibility. So it's not going to hold its rigid position as long as it would if it was the thicker pole. So you just kind of play with it. It's really, it's very intuitive. Now here's another friend of ours who um, is frustrated with this image of the weightless quilter. And I don't blame her because really the weightless quilter here is doing almost nothing. There's no support to the quilt. The majority of the quilt is dragging on the table and only the outside corners of the quilt are held up and and the rest of that quilt is it's definitely going to suffer from hoop drag it's going to drag that top frame off of the quilt and you don't want that the idea is to create a um, flat surface with the quilt and so that the weight of that that extends up to the fabric poles always lifts above the machine bed. So we're not just maintaining these, uh, the hold on the sewing field, the weightless quilter is lifting the whole quilt up. So her fabric clamps should be moved or not really the fabric clamps, but the, the quilt itself should be held closer to the sewing field to see where her white border, I mean, her blue border meets the white part of the quilt, that's probably where the fabric should be clamped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, Becky, so you've been struggling with the poles. Yeah, don't, you know, the poles are, they're, they're your friends. They're standing there holding that quilt. So don't, don't struggle with them. You know, try to work intuitively with them. Let's take another look at that video. Could we do that, Sam? The one where you see from the side, where how they flex see it'll be really uh, a much different experience and notice how the entire quilt is moving that's what you want you don't want the weightless quilter to fight with the machine you just want the entire quilt to move with the, the hoop as it moves. And now the design I have loaded on there is kind of a crazy design and, and it is um, intentionally going along vertical lines and also long horizontal lines so that we can get exaggerated movement to illustrate these points but on any embroidery machine any embroidery design that you're going to stitch you know you are eventually going to be getting in all those corners of the hoop right so i wanted to show you that this movement is perfectly natural and you can see like there's no movement on the bottom of the screen there that that fabric clamp the floor bar and is not lifting at all so it's really it's just a balance it's a little act of balance that I'm sure you will do very well with. Okay, so what else do we use the weightless quilter for? I love it for binding. Oh my, I love it for binding. That's my, you know, my second favorite task to use the weightless quilter for because at that point when it's time to do the binding, I've had it, right? I'm done with that quilt. I want to get it finished and boxed up and given as a gift or put on the bed that, um, you know, is... Uh, waiting for it. But 
when you use it for binding, you're just going to start at one corner and zoom down to the next corner, get up, rotate the quilt, go around the other end, and you know, all four sides. You know, and it's good to get up well while you're quilting and sewing, right? We don't want to sit in those chairs too long. It's good to get up and get some movement going. So I know many of you um, enjoyed the small town charms this year, and I sure had a blast doing it. And if you aren't familiar with the small town charms well you still have time to download all of these embroidery designs there was a new one every month january was a quilt shop february a, a bake shop the dress shop was in march and the flower shop in april may was the outdoor cafe and june the town hall july was a scoops home of the giant cone and in august we had a peaceful gazebo and then in September, it was the Book Nook, October, the Haunted House. And in November, we had the uh, Pet Store. December, the last one of the month, was the Tree Farm. And it looks a little bare. And that was by intention, because the whole idea of these small town charms all year is that you add your own creativity. And boy, have you done that. Let's take a look at some of your small town charms. Marilyn Rook Patno, look what she did. I love the fabric that she chose for the gravel area where the uh, wheels are of, of the Woody station wagon. She changed the name to Paras um, Fresh Trees and she most certainly added her their family name in the foreground. And they have a snowman. She decorated the wood sign and also added a Christmas present or a present at the feet of the fence. Candy Bray really went to town. So I had one tree in my uh, small town charm and she has almost a dozen trees. She also added a different landscape in the background. Notice she's got a has some trees or mountains in the in the background and she added a house with smoke chimney her dogs a fire hydrant somebody carrying a tree in the gravel path and also renamed um, the tree farm from avon to the doby tree farm really well done candy that is just beautiful uh, ginger it i agree it is beautiful really well done Really well done. Mm -hmm. Oh, Sybil, you're hoping that your small town charms will become a town quilt soon. Oh, I'd love to see a photo of it if you do that. Please share that. Post it on social media with um, the hashtag Dime So Along. We would love to see that. And oh, Retha, you missed the December reveal. Oh, you have to go get that for sure. It's it's really adorable. So what else do we have? We have Sue Brown of Sueville. She had a blast doing this. Candy canes were substituted for the traditional fence, and she added a snowman, decorated her tree with some bows and a star on the top, of course, named it Sueville Tree Farm, and added some garland right under that sign. And I noticed, Sue, that um, your window doesn't have a satin stitch, and I saw some comments from some other people that uh, on some... Uh, on some PES files that the satin outline of the window was not there. And I don't know why that is. So I apologize for that. It is on the uh, master file on the C2S when you, you know, of course, you know, when you download the design, you get all formats. So open that up on your machine or in software and take a look at it. And if it's not there, then just open the C2S and save it as another, uh, in another PES version and you'll be, you'll have success. Luann McKinder Green Greenberg, look at what she's done. First off, she expanded her sky. She's got a nice tall sky there and she's added more trees. A uh, young, uh, two people, I think, their kids walking into the tree farm. She's got a mailbox and a tree on the right, some uh, beautiful garland on the fence and also uh, Holly decorating the sign. Very well done. That is just beautiful. I love it. And then Renaud Paulson, she did a, again an outstanding job. I love the fabric that she chose. And she also added some um, Christmas balls. Um, they look like sleigh bells from hanging from the sign. And she's got some candy canes there. 
aren't they just great? I know everybody has. Um, I love the ideas that people bring to it. They're all a little bit different. And Sue S. Brown, most certainly a big thank you to you for the whole year of doing the, your OML sew along of the small town charms. We love how you and the whole OML gang um, participates and uh, we can't wait to see what you're going to do with our dime sew along in 2022. So that is super fun. Crystal Campbell, she also uh, interpreted it in a whole new way. She added Santa in the sky. She's got some stockings hanging from the sign. She's got an adorable child in the foreground, a snowman, presents in the foreground, and uh, a little snowman on the left. Oh, my goodness. The, the more you look at it, the more you notice of the added details that she did. So it's really super fun. Oh, thanks, Sue, for the kind words. You had so much fun with the small town charm. Well, it showed. I know your enthusiasm for it was really contagious to all of your OML gang. So we appreciate that. And, and we're looking forward to, um, you know, 2022 also. But we'll reveal that in January, one thing at a time, right? So we, uh, I appreciate you staying today and checking out the waitlist quilter. I know many of you have are enjoying the waitlist quilter, or maybe some of you have... Um, uh, plans to put it in your stocking if Santa would be so kind and maybe you are your own Santa and so if you are it's a good time to take advantage of it because it's on sale and it's also free shipping so um, I wish you uh, a good week a productive week getting ready for the holidays and I hope that um, well, you'll be here next week with me we're going to talk a little bit more about quilting not so much weightless quilter but small you know smaller projects so we look forward to seeing you then and i hope that you go and decorate your tree with spools of exquisite thread <laughs>